In this video, we are going to derive the relativistic correction to the orbits of planets. This is probably the simplest way to do it. This will allow us to calculate also the advance in the perihelium of uh, Mercury. And uh, we will start from uh, the following uh, considerations. So we will consider the motion of a particle, quote unquote particle. This particle can actually be a planet. And indeed, it, it is in the case of Mercury around the Sun. But let's call it a particle. Particle with mass m, lowercase m. And this mass m is uh, immersed in a gravitational field generated by a mass equal to capital M. We will start from the variation of the action. I will call the action A. So the variation of the action is the variation of an integral. In special relativity, we already use this integral, so it is in general written as minus mc ds. This is how we can write it in a special relativity. And from this uh, equation here, one can find the um, equations of special relativity, in particular when we set this equal to zero. And we can use this also in general relativity. And remember that ds squared can be written as c squared d tau squared, where tau is the proper time. And this can be written as dx mu, g mu nu, dx nu, where g mu nu in um, special relativity is equal to era mu nu, which is characterized by the following signature, 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1. Some other books use the opposite, so minus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. But I'm going to stick to this one. And now we are going to write the Schwarzschild metric, which uh, describes exactly the gravitational field generated by a static spherical body. And in particular, let me write down the S squared. In this case, we can write it as 1 minus 2G capital M divided by C squared R, C squared DT squared minus 1 over 1 minus 2G capital M C squared R dr squared minus r squared d theta squared minus r squared sine squared theta d phi squared like this and uh, in particular theta and phi are the usual angles that uh, one uses for uh, spherical coordinates so theta lies in the interval 0 pi whereas phi belongs to the interval 0 to pi. Some other books, for example, use the opposite. So phi would be an angle between 0 and pi, and theta would be an angle between 0 and 2 pi. But we are going to stick to this notation here. And this Schwarzschild metric can be obtained in different manners. So in general, it can be obtained by using Einstein's field equations in vacuum. One can show that uh, the solution to those equations for a spherical body is this metric here. One can also do the reverse. So one can start with this solution and then you can show that this actually solves Einstein's field equations in vacuum. And for example, I did it by using MATLAB. You can show that if you input the metric tensor that, that uh, you can obtain from uh, this equation here, ds squared equal to this expression on the right, you can show that this solves uh, Einstein's field equations. Uh, I will not uh, do the details here. I will not explain all the details regarding the Schwarzschild metric. We will start from this uh, point and then we will move on. So without loss of generality and due to the spherical symmetry, we can assume that the motion occurs on the plane theta equal to pi over 2. So this uh, equation here will simplify because uh, d theta will be 0 because uh, theta is a constant and it is equal to pi over 2. So we can get rid of uh, this term here, but let me rewrite uh, the equation below. So we have ds squared equal to 1 minus 2gm divided by c squared r, c squared dt squared minus 1 over 1 minus 2gm over c squared r, dr squared minus r squared d phi squared, like this because the sine squared of theta is equal to 1 in this case. And this can be set equal to c squared d tau squared. 
Now we will use this kind of notation here. So the derivative with respect to tau of a certain quantity will be equal to the quantity with a dot here. So this quantity with a dot will be the derivative with respect to proper time tau. The action can be written in this form. So integral of minus mc, and now we have the square root of 1 minus 2gm divided by c squared r, c squared t dot squared minus 1 over 1 minus 2gm divided by c squared r, r dot squared minus r squared phi dot squared, and then we have d tau. And uh, if you remember, we started from the expression here, this expression here. So we can, uh, if you want, we can also rewrite it as a equal to integral minus mc ds. And um, so this means that basically this expression here should be equal to minus mc squared because we have the tau here, so minus mc squared the tau is equal to minus mc ds. So this is the Lagrangian. If you want, the Lagrangian is equal to minus mc squared. And this square root here will be simply equal to c. If you want, it, it, this is equal to c tau dot, which is equal to c, because tau dot is equal to 1. It's d tau d tau, d tau divided by d tau. So now we can write down a set of Lagrange equations because uh, this Lagrangian depends on t, t dot, r, r dot, phi, phi dot. But we can see that the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to t is equal to zero because this square root here does not contain t. And this means that the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to t dot is equal to a constant. So this is a conserved quantity due to Lagrange equations, right? Because the derivative of this expression with respect to tau is equal to the derivative of L with respect to T, right? It is just Lagrange equations. And so this will imply the following. We can rewrite this derivative as minus MC, one minus two GM divided by C squared R times C squared T dot. This is divided by C. And this is simply due to the fact that we have to take the derivative of this square root. And then you can rewrite the square root in terms of uh, c. Anyway, this is equal to minus mc squared times 1 minus 2gm divided by c squared r. And then here you have t dot. And this is equal to, we'll set this equal to minus e, like this. So this is a constant, and you can, of course, easily understand that this constant is related to energy, because this is energy, and c squared is energy. This is a, a dimension, dimensionless uh, quantity, and t dot is also dimensionless, because we have time divided by time. So that's energy. Then we have another conserved quantity, if you look at it, uh, the expression uh, of, from before, because we have the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to phi, which is also equal to zero. And this means that the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to phi dot is a constant. And if you do the derivative, you have minus mc times minus r squared phi dot divided by c. And this is equal to m r squared phi dot, which is equal to a constant, and this constant is actually equal to an angular momentum that I will still call L, but please do not confuse this L with this L here. So this is the Lagrangian, whereas uh, this is angular momentum, right? From here, we obtain the following equation. So phi dot is equal to L divided by m r squared. And we are going to define this as omega phi. So omega phi is uh, an angular velocity with respect to the angle phi. So this equation is telling us how the planet is moving around the sun. In this case, so if we consider the sun with the mass capital M, 
So the planet is moving around the mass M. So you can sketch the situation like this. So you have the planet orbiting the sun. And uh, this will describe some angle phi. And phi dot or omega phi will give you the angular velocity in terms of phi. So this is how phi changes. Right? And um, now let's move on from uh, the equations that we got. From this one here, you can rewrite it as t dot equal to e divided by mc squared times 1 minus 2g m c squared r, like this. And we also have this equation here. And we are going to use the two equations that we just found. And we are going to input this equation. We are going to insert these two equations into the following. So the Lagrangian is equal to minus mc squared. Or if you want, we are going to square both sides. So we have l squared equal to m squared c to the fourth. Remember the, the expression for the Lagrangian. So we can write the Lagrangian also like this. And we can substitute t dot and phi dot by using the two expressions that we wrote here. This is what I'm going to do. And if you do that, we have m squared, c squared, then you get e squared divided by m squared, c squared, 1 minus 2g m, capital M in this case, so please do not confuse capital M and lowercase m, c squared r, then you get minus r dot squared divided by 1 minus 2g capital M over c squared r minus l squared divided by m squared r squared and this is equal to m squared c to the fourth. Now we can do some algebra here and um, I'm not going to do all the algebra. I mean, it, it is just uh, two or three steps. It will, really, it will really take a short time to do it. I'm going to rewrite this equation here like this. One half e squared minus m squared c to the fourth over mc squared, which is equal to one half m r dot squared plus one half r squared divided by m r squared then we get minus l squared g m divided by m r cubed c squared and then we get minus g m m over r now take a look at what we have on the right this is the kinetic energy of uh, the particle with mass lowercase m then here, these two terms are the classical terms for the potential energy. So this is the potential energy in the classical limit. So if you want, when I say classical, I mean non-relativistic in this case. So I should really write non-relativistic because you might get confused when I say classical because you might think of quantum mechanics, but that's not what I mean. I mean non-relativistic. And this correction here, is a correction to the potential energy because you can see the presence of g m divided by r and you can think of it as some kind of term related to the potential energy so it is a correction to the potential energy let's try to understand a little bit more about this equation and in particular also let's try to understand the term on the left so if we had a free particle which is not the case because we have a potential uh, we have potential energy here so this is not a free particle we have a gravitational field so definitely we are not considering a free particle or a free planet whatever you want to call it but if the particle were, were free so let's try to understand what would happen so the energy in particular the square of the energy would be approximately equal to so in this case i should i could write just equal because uh, if the particle were free, we could consider the laws of uh, special relativity. So this is equal to momentum squared, c squared, so the speed of light squared plus 
m squared c to the fourth. And from here, you can rewrite this equation as one half e squared minus m squared c to the fourth divided by m c squared, and this is equal to one half p squared over m. And this is none other than kinetic energy. And this is not the non-relativistic kinetic energy for a free particle, right? If we have a non-free particle, so if we have also a potential, the equation, we could think of rewriting this equation like this. So the total energy minus the potential energy squared is equal to P squared C squared plus M squared C to the fourth. And I mean, this equation here is not really an equality because we are in general relativity. So this is what we find for special relativity. But let's think that we can write this equation here. So you can rewrite it as E squared plus V squared minus two EV equal to P squared C squared plus M squared C to the fourth. And if you do some algebra, some very simple algebra, you can rewrite it as one half E squared minus M squared C to the fourth divided by M C squared approximately equal or just equal to p squared over 2m minus v squared over 2m c squared. Then we have plus ev over m c squared. Like this. So it's very simple algebra. And you can see on the right that we have kinetic energy. And then here, what do we have? So if we are considering the non-relativistic limit, V over MC squared will be very close to zero, or V squared over MC squared will be very close to zero because this term here, MC squared is much larger than V squared. So this term here can be neglected. And what about this one? Well, the energy for a non-relativistic particle will be approximately, approximately equal to mc squared, right? Because uh, its momentum or its velocity is much smaller than the speed of light. So E will be approximately equal to mc squared. So this term here will be approximately the potential energy. So you can see that this term here can be associated with uh, the energy of the system. So we are trying to make sense of this expression here. So on the left, we have the energy. On the right, we have indeed the kinetic energy plus the potential energy with a relativistic correction. That's what I wanted to show you. And now we are going to consider the potential energy. So the potential energy is exactly made up of uh, these three terms. We have a relativistic correction. So we have V equal to one half L squared divided by M R squared minus G capital M lowercase m over R minus L squared G M over M R cubed C squared. Now, planetary orbits are almost circular orbits. This means that uh, the radius of the orbit is not a constant, but it is, it is very close to R0. And R0 is such that the derivative of the potential with respect to R, evaluated at R equal to R0, is equal to 0. So it means that uh, R0 is the radius that minimizes the potential energy. So we can expand the potential in powers of R minus R0. And in particular, we are going to rewrite it as approximately equal to V minimum. And this V minimum is the minimum potential that we have at V of R0. So we have at the minimum potential at R equal to R0. So this is V of R0 plus omega R squared, R minus R0 squared over two times the mass M. So we have another angular frequency here, which is omega r. You can think of this as a definition, but this is the frequency of the oscillation of the radius of the orbit. So 
Conceptually, it is different from omega phi that we defined earlier. Conceptually. And let's see if indeed they will turn out to be different. If you recall, we had defined uh, omega phi somewhere earlier, and in particular it is here. Omega phi is related to the angular momentum. But let's move on. Let's move on. So we can calculate the derivative of the potential with respect to r at r equal to r0 and set this equal to 0. So we are going to use this expression. So you have to take the derivative of that expression and this will yield minus L squared divided by M R zero cubed plus G capital M lowercase m divided by R zero squared plus three L squared G M divided by M R zero to the fourth power c squared and we set this equal to zero you can see that this term is actually much smaller than the other two so if we neglect this term here you can obtain r0 as approximately equal to l squared divided by g m m g capital m lowercase m and then we also need to calculate the second derivative of the potential because uh, if we calculate the second derivative, we can find omega r squared multiplied by the mass m. So this is equal to the second derivative of the potential with respect to r. And uh, we are going to evaluate it at r equal to r0. So if you do the computation, you get 3 l squared divided by m r0 to the fourth power minus 2g capital M lowercase m divided by r0 cubed minus 12 l squared g capital m divided by m r0 to the fifth power c squared and remember that we also got the equation above that i'm going to rewrite here g capital m m over r0 squared from there i'm going to rewrite it as L squared over lowercase m r0 cubed minus 3 L squared g capital M over lowercase m r0 to the fourth power c squared. So I have simply rewritten this equation here and now I'm going to consider a system of equations of two equations and I'm going to, to use the second equation this one here and I'm going to substitute it there. So in place of this expression, I'm going to substitute this equation. And you can rewrite the equation above as omega r squared times m. This is equal to 3l squared over m r0 to the fourth power minus 2l squared divided by m r0 to the fourth power plus 6l squared gm over m r0 to the fifth power c squared minus 12 l squared g capital m divided by lowercase m r0 to the fifth power c squared so you can also rearrange these terms like this so you can factor out l squared divided by m squared r0 to the fourth power times m and then you have 1 minus 6g capital M divided by r0 c squared. And if you remember this term here, l squared divided by m squared r0 to the fourth power, this is equal to omega phi squared. So overall, you get omega r equal to omega phi square root of 1 minus 6g m over r0 c squared so in general in the classical limit this term here is negligible and this means that omega r is equal to omega phi so basically it means that the angular velocity with respect to r is equal to the angular velocity with respect to phi so the orbit remains the usual ellipse 
and the planet is moving on the ellipse, which is remaining fixed. So there is no change in the perihelion of the ellipse. But in this case, this is not so. Because the radius completes a revolution in a period which is equal to, let's call it capital TR. So let me write it as TR, which is equal to 2 pi divided by omega r. Because by definition, omega r is indeed related to the period with respect to um, the radial distance, so the radius r. If we calculate the change in the angle phi, this is equal to omega phi multiplied by tr. So we are going to calculate the change in the angle phi if a time equal to tr elapses. This is equal to omega r divided by the square root of 1 minus 6 g capital M over r0 c squared. And we multiply this by tr, which is equal to 2 pi over omega r. But this is equal to, of course, 2 pi divided by the square root 1 minus 6 gm divided by r0 c squared. But this term here is very small because uh, it contains c squared in the denominator. So this is small and we can expand it. Therefore, this is approximately equal to 2 pi times 1 plus this term here divided by 2, if you do a Taylor expansion. So we get 3 g capital M over r0 c squared. So you can see actually that the change in the angle phi, when uh, we consider a period for the radius r, is not actually equal to 2 pi. That's what we expect in the non-relativistic limit. But it is slightly more than that. So it means that if the planet starts here, let, let me do it with another color. So if the planet starts at this point, then the radius, so we assume that here we are measuring the radius from uh, this point, which is, for example, one of the two foci of the ellipse. But now we are really considering almost a, a circular orbit. So this is almost a circle. Uh, anyway, the planet is moving like this, in this direction. And in the meantime, this ellipse is actually moving. So it means that when the radius goes back to its initial value, which is this one, r0, if you want, then it is not really in this position, but it will be tilted. It will be slightly more than that. So it means that the angle that's... Uh, spanned by the radius is not 2 pi, but it is slightly more than 2 pi. And in particular, the amount by which it is greater than 2 pi is this. Let me call it delta phi, like this. So this is equal to 2 pi plus delta phi. And delta phi is equal to, or approximately equal to, if you want, 6 g capital M times pi, so let me put pi here, 6 pi g capital M divided by r0 c squared. And if you recall, r0 is approximately equal to this expression here. So we can also substitute that into our equation. So this will be approximately equal to, let me write equal to 6 pi g squared m squared lowercase m squared divided by c squared l squared, where remember that l is the angular moment. But this is exactly the formula that one can derive for the advance in the perihelium of Mercury. So you can also substitute the values for Mercury, and you will find that after taking into account all the classical effects, all the Newtonian classical effects, this kind of uh, formula is in perfect agreement with uh, the discrepancy that physicists found back in Einstein's days.